Hello, and welcome to today's university-based child and family policy consortium webinar. My name is Patricia Barton, and I'm the consortium coordinator. We're excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Developing, Implementing, and Evaluating an Evidence-Informed Supervised Visitation Program for Child Welfare-Involved Parents. Before I turn things over to our speakers, I want to say a few words about the consortium and about using GoToWebinar. The University-Based Child and Family Policy Consortium is a network of more than 25 university-based institutions, including centers, schools, departments, and programs that have an interest in child and family policy. We are organized around three main purposes. First, to share the latest findings and strategies for conducting policy-relevant research and to facilitate collaboration across our member institutions. Second, to encourage cross-disciplinary undergraduate and graduate training to support the next generation of child and family policy researchers. And third, to foster effective translation between research, practice, and policy audiences. The consortium is run in collaboration with the Society for Research and Child Development and hosts a number of webinars each year on a variety of topics. If you are interested in learning more about the consortium, having your institution join the consortium, or if you would like to join our listserv, please see the information on this slide. Just a quick word before we begin about the technology we are using today. We are using GoToWebinar to host this webinar. All of the attendees are muted. If you have questions for the speakers, please use the question box on your screen to submit them. Today's webinar is being recorded. After it ends, I will be uploading it to SRCD's YouTube channel and we'll share that link with all registrants. Please feel free to share the link widely. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speakers to introduce today's topic. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on whatever time zone you are in. My name is Susan Barkin and my colleagues and I are delighted to be here today to talk with you about our work developing the STRIVE Supervised Visitation Program, which we've been working on for about the last five years. Um, I'd like to start by introducing my colleagues without whom this work would not be possible. So if we Yep. Uh, Laura Orlando, STRIVE Project Director, Lori Lippold, Policy Director at Partners for Our Children, and Kimberly Shoecraft, STRIVE Training and Curriculum Manager. Next slide, please. We all work at Partners for Our Children, um, which is a center based at the University of Washington, which was founded in 2007 and has a mission to improve the lives of vulnerable children and families, especially those touched by the child welfare system. Next slide, please. So today we're gonna to provide some background on the STRIVE development process, including linking this work to policy and larger system reform efforts. We're gonna talk a little bit about the pilot data that we've collected and also talk about training and our plans to sustainably disseminate STRIVE more broadly. We have a lot more we could talk about than we can cover during this webinar, so we've provided a couple of handouts that provide some additional detail. But I'd also invite you to get in touch with us if you have additional questions or would like further information. And our contact information is available at the end of the PowerPoint. So here's how this webinar is going to flow. We'll first hear from Laura Orlando, who will get us started by talking about background on the development of STRIVE. And during her presentation, she's going to pause a couple of times so that we can hear from Lori Lippold about related policy work that was simultaneously taking place. This is all in an effort to give you a picture of the different facets of the development process. And then we'll hear from Kimberly Shoecraft about training and plans for sustainable dissemination. And then we'll wrap up the presentation with a summary of lessons learned and then have time for your questions. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Laura Orlando. Next slide, please. Hello, so as Susan mentioned, about five years ago, we started really um, from nothing, actually, and really set about with um, commitment from our organization, from Partners for Our Children, to use some funding um, to develop a parenting intervention that would specifically meet the needs of child welfare-involved parents. Um, and also, um, some of what we heard about the current evidence-based uh, parenting programs were that uh, they were expensive to operate, there was um, a lot of turnover in staff, they were expensive to train staff up, and um, also didn't always um, engage parents um, who, um, for whom you know, were involved with child welfare. And so we really wanted to, to start from a place where we would learn about what are the needs of those families, what could intervention look like, 
and then build the rigor for that uh, intervention over time. And so we really um, just wanted to create something um, that would really kind of turn how we treat uh, birth parents um, early in this kind of stressful, traumatic experience on its head and just really create something that would engage them and um, really honor um, where they're at in this um, difficult experience. And so we started by, um, like good researchers, kind of looking at the data. Next slide, please. And um, we also, I guess, to be honest, started kind of with a Washington State-centric focus with an idea that whatever we created would have applicability beyond our state um, and for other systems. But um, so at that time, in 2014, there were over 400,000 children in care across the United States. I think that number's only increased. Um, in Washington State, there were um, 8,500 children in care at that time. I think now, I, I took a look last week, and it's about 8,900 children in care, and the bulk of which, two-thirds of which, are under the age of eight. And then um, also noted that um, for children in care, that there's the potential for thousands of parent-child visits to be happening each week. Next slide, please. So then we um, kind of set about on a journey <laughs> where we um, spoke with as many stakeholders as um, we could. And so we engaged over 100 stakeholders um, that were representative of the legal community, um, administrators from our own Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families, researchers from around the country, uh, parent allies, which are parents who um, have at one point or another been involved in the system and successfully um, regain custody of at least one child, and um, Washington State is very fortunate in that we have a very rich group of parent allies, um, and really um, we count them as some of our most important stakeholders in this work, and then um, talked with service providers who were actually doing visit supervision and other kinds of services for parents um, in, in our state and actually in other places in the country. Then we did um, a pretty thorough scan of the child welfare literature and um, took this information and worked with a design committee internal that was made of staff, faculty, providers, and of course, um, really took a lot of guidance from an instructional designer about how to create a program that would um, kind of adhere to adult learning and really be um, engaging for the, for the families and parents. And then, um, as I said, we also um, took some of the curriculum and actually tried it out with our um, parent allies and really, um, you know, took what they had to say and made adjustments to the curriculum and just really um, have been closely working with them throughout the whole process. Next slide. Okay, so what did we learn? Um, I think maybe a little bit into the stakeholder process, it was certainly not towards the end, we kind of identified that there was definitely a gap in programming related to parent-child visits, and we really thought this was a missed opportunity um, because it's currently where um, the out-of-home community is actually actively parenting their children, and so we thought that um, that was a really important um, moment. And also, um, you know, you're putting highly stressed parents in rooms with stressed children, and, um, you know, it just, sometimes doesn't lead to a very successful time for either of them. And then um, also noted we're really a lack of structure and accountability regarding visits. Um, our state at the time was spending upwards of $26 million um, on visits and just really no good sense of, you know, how, what was the quality of these interactions, um, you know, how did uh, parents and children do in these visits? How did it help them in the life of their case? How did we know when they were making progress? How do we know when we could reduce supervision levels and things like that? Um, and just really um, noting that it was an important and often missed opportunity to reduce trauma. And I don't know um, about those of you on the call, but in Washington State I can say, and unfortunately I can say that it's probably not much different um, on the whole across the state, but really um, we kind of have had a policy where, you know, during supervised visits, there's somebody, you know, in the room with the parent 
with either a laptop or a notepad, and they're just kind of documenting um, what the parents often isn't doing well. Sometimes I think they capture what they're doing well, but um, just really, and then and kind of keeping that information to themselves, and sometimes the parents not finding out what isn't going well until either the social worker calls them and says, hey, there's a problem in your visits, or sometimes, unfortunately, even in court. And so we just wanted to be able to turn that into kind of a learning opportunity for the families. Um, yeah, and then just some of what we heard from parent allies about their own experience at the time that their children were removed and they were visiting. Um, just really poignant and just kind of, um, I feel like, typical of the need for, you know, why we need these kinds, this kind of a program. Okay, next slide. And then, so our development goals um, for this work were always to collaborate very closely with the Washington State Department of uh, Children, Youth, and Families. We really wanted them to um, be at the table with us from day one so that they would view this as their program um, and really endorse it and engage with it and also to create something that um, would meet their needs of their families. And so um, we set about to create a new parent support and education program. And um, there's certainly at the time and you know, continue to be a number of different evidence-based parenting programs, but most of which have been adapted for use with child welfare involved families and um, don't always um, hit the mark in that sense. And so we really wanted to, to start with something based on their unique needs and focus on improving the quality of visits reducing trauma, increasing resilience and well-being for both children and parents. And um, also Partners for Our Children, um, at the time we had, um, we were developing some visitation technology called Oliver that would help us to track um, visit data and accountability. And so we were kind of multi-pronged um, <laughs> trying to address um, issues related to visitation in our state. And then, as I said earlier, over time, evaluate Strive's effectiveness through rigorous research, and then um, create what we you know, a freely available program and training kind of system that could be disseminated widely and adapted for other populations and locations. So thank you, Laura. Um, yeah. So we set out to do that, but before we go on with that part of the process, we're going to hear from. Lori Lippold about the policy work that was happening behind the scenes to um, share about that. Great, thank you. Thank you for including me in this. I, I feel like I'm a little bit of the um, public service announcement or commercial <laughs> interlude. Um, go get your coffee now. The, <laughs> so my role at Partners for Our Children is to really work with staff, legislators, legislative staff, the executive branch, uh, including the agencies, et cetera, to pull together our legislative and policy priorities um, and take those to the appropriate body. Typically, it is the legislative and executive branches, but we are always trying to base our public policy priorities on available research and data. And that combines with certainly what is of interest to elected officials, what's of interest to folks who are running the, the agencies, in this case, the now called Department of Children, Youth, and Families. It's a new agency, and you might hear me sometimes say the Children's Administration. That is what it used to be called up until uh, fairly recently when we are now the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. So we are, are always uh, trying to be as, as beneficial and useful in the process as possible and also know that we do try to drive some of the, the policy activities and actions of the elected bodies. So back in 2013 um, and prior to that, there has been a lot of discussion out here related to evidence-based programs, as you've heard, and really shifting that those evidence-based programs, as you all know, usually have a fairly significant cost associated with them. And we were hearing more and more about what they were using or wanting to use at the Department of Children, Youth, and Families with child welfare involved families. And that every time you have new staff, and, and we have had a fair amount of staff turnover here, 
that you then have to train people up or when people leave their private agency job, or whatever, training them up. So a lot of discussion going on around that and what do we do? And one thing would be, well, what about this possibility of, of developing an open source parenting program specifically geared towards child welfare involved families? So that's how my involvement really began. Our then uh, director of Partners for Our Children and research director had been involved with developing an open source program for incarcerated parents, so had experience in that realm. And there were increasing discussions going on with the private sector, our philanthropic community, which has been very um, active in the child welfare realm in this state for quite some time talking with, with possible funders about what we could do, how do we make this happen, and obviously also working with the folks at the department to talk about what are their needs and can we get behind something together. The more we can work collaboratively, as was said previously, the better. So there was a lot of interest on the part of a lot of people to do this, and we decided to go for it, and we met started meeting with legislators and others about getting some funding. Uh, we, were, we felt we had a strong commitment from the private sector to advance this if we could get some public money, and that's something the public wants to know the private's involved and the private wants to know the public is <laughs> invested. So I think that that worked well. Again, we had a, a lot of support from the folks at the uh, department and the private sector legislators were becoming increasingly interested. And in 2014, there was a proviso in the budget, so this didn't happen through a separate bill per se, but as part of the budget, language that said 150,000 of the general fund state appropriation for fiscal year 2015 is provided solely for training, technical assistance, and fidelity oversight for an open source parenting program developed by a university-based child welfare research entity. Expenditure of the amount provided in this subsection is contingent upon the availability of private or local funds necessary for the research entity to develop the open source parenting curriculum. The Children's Administration must make the open source parenting program available to parents with an open child welfare case beginning January 1, 2015. So that was our statutory guidance, and then what you heard from Laura and Susan already is really uh, where they all took this from that point forward. Great. Back to you. Okay. <laughs> so what is STRIVE? <laughs> um, as Susan said, it's a supervised visitation program, and um, Given what we learned, you know, with the early data that, you know, two-thirds of the children were under the age of eight, we really set to focus on that um, age group first um, because we thought we could reach more um, children that way. And um, even that is a big developmental swath, but um, we felt like we could manage that a little better than the birth to 18. <laughs> um, so one of the things we also learned at the time was there really was no um, other curriculum for parent-child visits. There, um, there was um, visit coaching by Marty Beyer, which is a wonderful model too, but it, there wasn't really a curriculum that someone week by week could work through um, a different set of knowledge and skills with the parents. And so um, because we also wanted to um, keep it more affordable and at the paraprofessional level, we really need a, it, it, we needed a curriculum um, that could you know, lend itself to fidelity and to parents kind of receiving the same information in roughly the same way. Um, and just really uh, taking, you know, the evidence um, that we found through the research and practice um, information that we learned through all of our um, interviews and having a sense of wanting to have, have it be trauma-informed. And there is a handout attached that um, talks about how STRIVE is trauma-informed. And then also to have it be developmentally tailored. One of the things we learned was that... Um, Parents were often sent to these kind of one-size-fits-all parenting groups, and we really wanted to make it relevant to the parent and child in front of, or children in front of, um, the visit navigator, as we call the person that delivers the program. And so we really consider it to be developed by and for child welfare stakeholders. And um, 
It's delivered in the context of parent-child visits over five weeks. Um, it's a five-week program and delivered once per week and early in the life of the case, as early as possible, um, to kind of shore up those early visits. And why did we focus on visits? Because we knew they were um, very challenging for the parents and the children, and the parents really needed support and information. Uh, a lot of times they were just kind of walking into this situation not knowing what to expect or what the rules, excuse me, what the rules were or what was, what even the department was kind of looking for them from in their visits and what, um, how would they know they were, you know, doing what they needed to do. And then we just also thought that if we could engage the families early and um, kind of have them have some early successes, that this may lead to um, them engaging in other services and things that they needed. And then just as I said, it fills a gap and it needed support for parents. Next slide, please. Okay, and so um, the program, as I said, is five weeks. Um, these are the five sessions. I'm not gonna go too much into what's included in each session because there's also a handout that talks a little bit more in depth about um, what we're trying to do. But I will say that um, a common feature of all five sessions is really um, stress reduction is kind of infused um, at the beginning of sessions to kind of help calm the stress brains of the parents. Um, and also, um, right before um, the children come into the visit, they also have another practice that they choose to um, kind of get calm and um, focused and ready for that time with their children. Um, some of the things we work on is a visit routine. Why do those matter? What are the elements of that? How do you set one up? Um, and kind of how do you manage the hello and the very difficult goodbye at the end of the visit? And how do you create you know, routines around that, and, um, you know, how do you manage challenging behaviors in the context of visits, and use of praise, and then um, we teach them some communication skills that they can use to make requests of their children who are older, children, you know, at least two, I'd say, and then adults involved in their case. And then, and something that's really um, become something really important is in session two and connect and reassure or actually it starts in session one, um, we share with them the visit report. Um, in Washington State, we have um, what's called the parent-child visit report. I'm sure other jurisdictions have something kind of similar, um, but we show them a blank one, and then um, the visit navigator also kind of shares if there's something that they had to write them up for, or just if there's good things they wanna um, put in that report, but just really being transparent about the data being collected on them during their visits. And we found that to be very powerful for the parents. Um, next slide, please. And so the way that the delivery model uh, works is that it's delivered one-on-one -on -one between a parent or parents, um, it, there's two parents involved, um, with their visit navigator. It's the same visit navigator for the five weeks of the program and um, there's a set of knowledge and skills that they work on for each of the five weeks. They're usually different other than kind of the stress reduction skills. And then um, the visit navigator follows the parent into what we call a supported visit with um, the parent and children present where they practice their new knowledge and skills. And then that followed up, um, the child or children um, are transported back home and there's a 15 minute debrief, again, just one-on-one -on -one with the parents or parents and visit navigator. And this is just a really uh, incredibly powerful time where the parent hears about what the visit navigator saw went well, the parent can talk about what they felt went well, they can also have a moment to kind of let down um, if they're being, you know, feeling emotional after having said goodbye, or talk about what they feel like didn't go well and where they could use some support for their next visit. Um, yeah, and so we kind of learned um, with adult learning theory, too, that um, in this kind of context with these highly stressed parents, that one-on-one um, -on -one, um, is kind of best. Okay, um, so what makes STRIVE different? Next slide, please. Um, we know that states and federal law have increasingly required the use of evidence-based programs even though the adoption of evidence-based programs has been slow, as we said, in, in part due to the high cost of implementation and turnover. 
and so um, also um, expensive to customize for um, different populations, and few of them have been developed specifically for child welfare involved families, none specific to visitation. So unlike these other evidence-based programs, STRIVE was really designed um, to be low cost using paraprofessionals and also to include you know, the training component. And then um, we've had a lot of success in um, having parents come each week because it occurs right in front of something, their supervised visit in which they're very motivated to be there. And, um, and then kind of really flipping things on our, the head, <laughs> Um, we took one and a half million dollars of private money to develop something that would be um, used to create um, or available for public for free or uh, low cost to use. So um, once we had kind of our program ready to go and uh, we we're going to try it out, we um, had a pilot in June of, that started in June of 2016. We worked with seven DCYF offices in Western Washington, three visitation providers, with the goal of having 50 parents complete the program and another 50 to serve as the comparison group. Next slide, please. And then we had a, a number of different um, data sources to look at some outcomes. So we were interested in looking at, did this program help um, increase visit attendance and punctuality? Did it help to decrease unusual incidents reports, which are events that happen in visits that they get documented for? That could be things such as bringing someone you're not supposed to bring to a visit or leaving the child unattended or things like that. Um, and then we also used parent surveys. We interviewed the parents after the first and fifth sessions of the program um, to capture data from them around their engagement with their visit navigator, the quality of um, the parent-child visit, stress management use, and um, kind of the value they felt in that, uh, satisfaction with the program, and then just some basic um, background information such as demographics and the social support they had or didn't have in their lives. And then we um, had a, have a checklist that the, pro, uh, the visit navigators complete after each session that kind of monitor things like uh, participation in the program and fidelity, and then also um, parental skill demonstration and practice of those things. Next slide, please. And so from that first pilot, um, parents um, were an average of 30 years. Um, kids were uh, about two years old. Notably, um, a quarter of the parents were homeless or unstably housed. About a third hadn't completed high school or a GED. And over a third um, reported kind of multiple needs for ass assistance, um, the most common being parenting, housing, uh, help with employment, transportation, food, and other things like substance use treatment, mental health, and emotional support. So very high needs families um, involved with the program and obviously child welfare in general. Uh, next slide, please. So we feel we feel pretty happy about the completion rate. 88% um, of our parents started and finished the program. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we were not able to recruit a comparison group um, for this pilot, but we've remedied that with our next pilot, um, but still learned a lot uh, about what was working or what families liked about the visit. So um, Strive Parents, um, well, we did have a propensity score matched uh, group of parents that we looked at, um, but we did not interview. But so our Strive Parents were less likely to miss their visits compared to that group, were more pre ah, prepared when they did show up for their visits, and did um, notice an increase in the use of stress management strategies, um, helping them to be less anxious about their visits. And 100% of parents found the program to be helpful and felt supported by their visit navigator, and almost all of them would recommend um, the program to another parent in a similar situation. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, all right, we're gonna keep going. Next slide, please. So our second pilot, um, which is still underway, we're hoping to wrap that up very soon, started in October of 2017. We worked with five DCYF offices, two in Eastern Washington, three in Western, and four visitation providers. Um, I will say that the, the majority of these families are actually um, from Eastern Washington, 
Um, in this pilot, we really wanted to try the use of a network administrator, someone that kind of oversees um, all of the visits and referrals, and that's called Family Impact Network here. And so they've been, they were very helpful in helping to kind of um, identify referrals and direct them to the Strive program. Um, so our goal was, again, 50 parents through Strive, 50 comparison group. Uh, to date, we've got 45 who um, are enrolled. So I think 44 of those have finished the program and 34 um, in the comparison group. And we're hoping to finish that up soon. And so um, preliminary analysis uh, showed that there's some promising and consistent findings with the, um, with the pilot one findings from pilot two. And what did we learn? 100% um, of both parents, uh, or of parents in both pilots one and two, um, said that Strive helped them in their visits, covered most of what was needed about that experience. Uh, there was a feeling of mutual respect between them and their visit navigator, and they um, um, said that they plan to continue to use what they learned in the program. Okay, next slide. So where are we to date? Um, we're finishing up, so we've only nearly got 100 families through the program. So we're really still um, working on building the evidence for the program. We have been listed on the California Evidence-Based Clearinghouse as a program highly relevant to child welfare, and we'll keep working on the uh, rigor um, and proof that it actually helps parents. We've created a Train the Trainer program, which Kimberly will talk about shortly. Um, and we've worked with uh, piloting the program uh, both within and outside of the United States. And we have a Spanish version uh, available. And we've received a grant, and we're currently in the works of creating um, an adaptation for Native families. And then um, very soon, we're going to uh, start a regional expansion of Strive in Washington State. It will be in um, what's called Region 1. And um, our goals are to build on the current pilot experience and expertise, use um, the visitation referral and tracking infrastructure that um, currently is called Oliver, but I don't think will be for too much longer, expand training capacity with the Alliance for Child Welfare Excellence, which are also co-located here at the University of Washington, um, and then assess the usefulness of STRIVE in helping, um, we hope, the department to think about how to make safe and appropriate visitation, visit supervision levels, um, that we hope it'll be a useful part of the data for them, and then track visitation outcome data via parent-child reports and um, maybe look at um, system level data too. Yeah. So of course, this is also involved work in the policy arena. So we'll also hear again from Lori Lippold about that. Thank you very much. And I will be brief. Um, so back in, well, it's been going on a while, but, but we do have a law I want to mention in our state that really does require that parents have visitation, that there's a right for parents and children to have visits when the children are in out-of-home care, as well as siblings have visits when they are separated. So that kind of underlies a lot of this. As all of this work was going on to develop and begin implementing STRIVE, there were a lot of discussions going on among legislators and among advocates, including those uh, Laura mentioned previously, parent allies, foster parents, others, about parent-child visitation generally. So we were weaving in what was going on with STRIVE in a lot of these conversations, but, but many of them were about parent-child visitation uh, which is now being called family time, by the way, parent-child visitation more broadly. And in 2015, the legislature did include, again, as a budget proviso with no money attached, but just a directive that the Children's Administration shall adopt policies to reduce the percentage of parents requiring supervised visitation, including clarification of the threshold for transition from supervised to unsupervised visitation prior to reunification and then they would submit a report on that, that work. So 
we are always interested in looking at what a program like Strive might do to lead to that as well, a, a quicker uh, move from supervised to unsupervised. Part of the reason for the focus on moving from supervised to unsupervised is because of the cost associated with supervised visits. And we were spending, I think at the time, around $27 million a year. Now I believe it's around $30 million, and somebody can correct that um, <laughs> if that's inaccurate, but I believe it's around $30 million a year on supervised visitation or, and or transportation, the whole visitation realm. So the legislature was very interested in taking a look at this. We have also had some individual legislators who have a particular interest in the the way in which visitation was happening. They were concerned maybe about the cost, but really also how was it going. Um, after that budget proviso and that budget passed, sometime later the department pulled a group of people together to really look at their policies. And that group came together, I believe, in the late summer, early fall of 2015, and a report was done and brought to the legislature. And in 2016, a lot of these discussions really continued. The policies, I think, that came, that we talked about, that group talked about, and have been in place are, are quite fabulous. I mean, they did talk about let's identify that it, the assumption would be an unsupervised visit unless you can demonstrate that a supervised visit is needed. So I believe that there was a lot of support for the, the policies around visitation. The practice was not quite caught up with that, and I think that's always a big challenge. Implementation is uh, of anything is a lot harder than getting the, the words on paper, if you will. So as a result of that uh, work, the, the committee, then the Human Services and Early Learning Committee, um, actually that's what it is now, brought people together who served on that to talk about how it went and what some of the ongoing challenges were and a representative in particular from that committee continued to meet with individuals from the department, the Office of Public Defense, parent allies, foster parents, and others of us who work on these issues just to say, okay, where do we need to go from here? What do we need to keep doing? Again, these are all kind of things happening at the same time. There has also been or was also a lot of interest in having visitation become part of the forecast so that the costs associated with visits might be able to reflect what was actually being provided. And visitation had been taken out of the forecast for the department's budget during the recession. So we were trying to get that back in, and actually, eventually, that did happen in legislation passed in 2018. Now, how that can actually accommodate the per cap associated with a model like Strive, we still need to be working through, but at least visitation is now a forecasted part of our budget. The One of the things that, um, that came up quite a bit was the cost associated with doing Strive. And again, we felt that we had been uh, working Everyone had been working collaboratively and in a lot of agreement about the model, although there were other efforts going on that I think sometimes were confusing to people like me about other pilots. And so one thing or another is called a pilot. It's like, wait, are you talking about the same thing I am? And so we have had a lot of discussions trying to sort through what's what and who's doing what and when are we talking about Strive. But we uh, talked about Strive a lot with legislators and with others, and, uh, and I think there was um, some good support inside the agency for trying to advance that. So what was one of the barriers to advancing the Strive model was money. Um, we, we went to the legislature in 2018 to try to get some funding in the budget to implement Strive, and unfortunately that did not happen. But all of this continued to be talked about, and in 2019, the primary legislator on the House side, who has been focusing on visitation, agreed that she would try for money in the budget, and a new senator who had been elected um, and was serving his first year in 2019 
was interested in Strive, uh, has, had done some work as a defense attorney, so kind of had a pretty good sense of how the parent-child visitation had gone, and he was willing to take this on as one of his budget priorities. So this past session, we were successful in getting some money included in the budget, and I will read that to you. It is $250,000 of the general fund state appropriation for fiscal year 2020 and $250,000 of the general fund state appropriation for fiscal year 2021 are provided solely for implementing the supportive visitation model that utilizes trained visit navigators to provide a structured and positive visitation experience for children and their parents. Now, in addition to the budget bill, we also have agency detail. Um, in that detail, it is a bit clearer that we are talking about the uh, model developed by the University of Washington in collaboration with or something like that, uh, the DCYF. So we, we have a kind of a prohibition, if you will, it's not that strong, but against naming programs in our legislation. So that's why we don't see it called STRIVE. So we're now at that point, $500,000 for this biennium to, as Laura said, implement and continue expansion in uh, a part of Eastern Washington. Great, thank you so much, Lori. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of an overview of our timeline and where we've been uh, over the last few years. And we've mentioned um, the expansion, but in a very important part of that is also expanding training capacity and creating plans for broader dissemination. And that's another piece that we're working very um, actively on and is really integrally related to expanding in, um, in the state as well. And so to talk a little bit more about that and is, um, will be Kimberly Shukraft. I will also um, next be, slide, please. Yeah, I will also be very brief. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you briefly about our training process currently, and then what our hopes are for the future, as well as ongoing coaching and support. Next slide. So uh, currently we are um, offering three days of face-to-face -face training. Uh, we usually have about 20 or so participants, 15 to 20 participants in that face-to-face -face training. The training is focused on, uh, it has a very practical approach uh, for preparing visit navigators to use the program with families. So um, the training focuses a lot on uh, doing activities uh, um, and practicing the, the STRIVE skills. Uh, we do have a future goal to develop parts of the training to be delivered online. Um, as folks have been saying here, we're very aware of the costs of implementing um, practices like STRIVE and other evidence-based uh, parenting practices. And so if we can develop a portion of our training to be delivered online via videos, um, it will bring the, the cost down by having fewer days of face-to-face -face training. Uh, we still want face-to-face -face training to happen as there's a large practice element, um, Strive Navigators being able to get some feedback about how they're doing. Next slide, please. So, um, with ongoing monitoring, coaching, and support, currently uh, we are doing weekly check-in calls and we're training sites when we go out to do training. Uh, we're training sites to take over those weekly check-in calls as well. Um, so they're currently facilitated by a Strive trainer. Um, they're meant to monitor fidelity to the Strive model as well as provide positive feedback to visit navigators and then problem solving for any issues they're facing. Um, as we all know, child welfare systems are complicated and um, there's not very many straightforward things about working uh, with the families and courts and, and those kinds of things. Um, navigators also in, enter information about their Strive sessions uh, and visits into a database that's monitored. And so the folks on these coaching calls would be also looking at that information. 
Next slide. So the other part of what we're doing to offer ongoing support are what we're calling rapid trainings. And so these trainings have been developed and completed as issues arise for Visit Navigators. A recent example of this, um, our team developed what was called Cultivating Compassion. This included information about developing compassion for um, the self and then as well as families uh, that are served by Strive. So the reason that we're looking at ongoing monitoring and coaching and support um, is that the research literature is pretty um, there's really a lot of information out there um, that when folks are using a manualized program, if there is not ongoing support and, mo and monitoring, there tends to be what we call bottle drift. And so um, you can see there's a couple of citations below, but one of the um, one of the one evidence-based uh, practice program that focuses specifically on um, child welfare involved families has done quite a bit of research on uh, how ongoing coaching and support uh, can help folks stay with uh, the model a little bit better so keep fidelity with the model as well as um, also there's evidence to support that um, people doing this kind of work have greater job satisfaction when they're supported in it and of course that makes logical sense to us. Um, there's also evidence, there's also research to support that when providers are using evidence-based parenting approaches um, and having ongoing quality assurance monitoring outcome for parents are better as well. So um, in building a sustainable model for training, uh, we are currently working in partnership with the Alliance for Child Welfare Excellence. Um, this is an arm of the School of Social Work um, in, in Washington State that partners with DCYF to provide uh, support and training and coaching for uh, child welfare practitioners. So this will be a little bit of an expansion of their role in to you know, starting to work with our provider system. Um, they will be trained as Strive trainers in order to provide that ongoing training and support um, for community agency partners. This will also keep costs down for ongoing training. We're also in the process of developing a certification um, program or process for visit navigators, trainers, and coaches that will help us monitor quality assurance as well. And then we're also in the process of looking at creating agency level coaches to keep costs down for agencies and providing ongoing uh, visit navigator monitoring and support. Great. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, so just to um, kind of summarize, so we have a little time for questions. Um, We've learned a lot in the last five years doing this work um, across different jurisdictions about the many challenges that systems face in trying to do reform related to child welfare visitation. Um, some of the things we've identified include, you know, there being a problematic lag between when children are removed and when they have an opportunity to visit with their parents. Obviously, that's it. we don't see Strive as the panacea for all of these things, but we want to be part of um, constructi a constructive part of a system that's trying to address the many aspects of um, the challenges. So um, I'm just outlining what some of those are and the pieces that we think we may be able to help with on some level. Uh, Many uh, many parents and children are visiting in very inadequate spaces, um, and so it really can create challenges for the interactions themselves between the parents and children. Um, transportation, we've learned, is a huge barrier to visitation, both for parents, even though um, our Department of Children, Youth, and Families provides bus tickets and car ORC cards and gas reimbursement and do a lot of things to try and address that. It's still a challenge to access reliable transportation, and um, that's just it's just a reality that it needs to be part of sort of the solution is thinking about how to address the transportation challenges. And um, 
one thing that also often comes out as we've been trying to integrate STRIVE within a child welfare system is that um, visitation uh, service providers, often there's not really an air traffic controller coordinating the referrals and all of that. And so one of the things that we've really uh, benefited from in working with the Family Impact Network, the network administrator, um, has been that they've really played a role that's helped with that. Um, but maybe other jurisdictions have come up with other ways of dealing with that. And so we'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, your, your ways of addressing these kinds of challenges. Um, we've also learned that parents aren't systematically oriented to their visit experiences. And that is something that we really do try to address in STRIVE. It's built into the program. We also have learned, as you know, many of you know who are providers, that these parents are not just you know, trying to reunify with their children, they're also struggling with very real challenges, um, such as substance use, mental health challenges, homelessness, um, poverty. Many of the things that the parents who interviewed said were challenges. And again, STRIVE is not intended to provide those services, but if there is a way of identifying needs for families and using that early on as a way to help um, match services with needs, um, we would love to explore whether STRIVE can be helpful in that capacity. Um, and we find that um, having a systematic process for making decisions about safe and appropriate levels of supervision uh, could be a really important contribution of STRIVE. We would like to explore whether it can be helpful in that regard. So if we're having parents visiting early on in their case, and these visits are supervised, can what, what um, visit navigators are learning be useful to um, child, the caseworkers in helping them have information that may be helpful to them in making uh, recommendations or to judges around safe and appropriate levels of supervision so that those resources which are expensive can be most optimally utilized. So in summary, um, next slide just basically says this in a more positive frame. What have we learned leads to better visits? So having a safe, consistent, and family-friendly space to visit, consistently orienting parents to rules and expectations around visits, pro providing support in the context of visits, celebrate what they're doing well, and um, creating more opportunities to help them do more well. Uh, transparency about what's being collected on them, and um, having visit navigators who really are trained to understand and respect what the parents are going through and what the struggles are, and have an appropriately defined role in their what they can and cannot do to support those parents, and working in collaboration with the department um, to help inform and get those needs met for parents and supporting connections to other services and resources needed by the families. So um, that's really a very nutshell version of what we've been doing. And we would welcome your questions. I see that some have been coming in, your comments and thoughts as well. Um, so this, this question that just came in, uh, can you clarify where this falls on the timeline once a child is removed? We are aiming to have STRIVE be delivered early, as early as possible, as, you know, as soon as possible with when parents are starting to visit with their children, because we want to help them get off to a good start. See, the visit navigator relationship has been really positive and important to them, and so we think if we can build some trust and hope and positive engagement, maybe that will transfer to some of the other things that those parents do. So early on is really a primary goal. Um, and then, yes, parents are involved in supervised visits much longer than five visits. So then our ideal, and which we've been talking with our Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and what we are talking with, with folks in other jurisdictions, is to have a supportive visitation environment that continues. Where there, whereas there won't be an actual curriculum that's continuing to be developed, but um, the other supervisors, visit supervisors who may not be delivering STRIVE per se, would be trained as part of the training 
to at least provide a supportive visit environment. And um, so that we're sort of shifting how visits are experienced by parents. Like these first five weeks are more intensively focused and then the continued uh, visits would have a more supportive um, feeling to them than they currently do. And that's very much something that's been identified consistently throughout our state as a high priority and goal. Um, I know we had another question uh, pre-seminar, I mean pre-webinar, about best practice regarding the frequency of visits. And I wondered, Kimberly, if you could maybe just say what your, your knowledge and experience is with that. Yeah, um, I would be happy to. So the current thinking or I guess thinking for a while about best practices is that young children should see their parents as often as possible. Um, and there are many parts of Washington state where, you know, for a long time, uh, children were only seeing their parent about once a week or, or maybe twice a week if we were lucky. But best practice is for children to see their parents, you know, as frequently as possible in visits. And then also in the least restrictive setting as possible. So you heard um, Lori Lippold talk about um, the fact that the legislature wants to reduce the amount of money being spent on visits in Washington state. This is also, you know, thinking about developmental processes for young children and, and families for young children. This is also best practice for young children that if there aren't major safety concerns in visits, you know, they should be done in their family home, uh, in environments where, where it, children are most comfortable. Um, this is Lori. Thank you, Kimberly. I just I, I don't want to misspeak or speak for the legislature. I think there was a lot of interest in uh, the amount being spent and the desire to go more quickly as possible to unsupervised as much about the uh, the policy and the practice and what's good for families as I haven't heard them say necessarily they want to reduce the amount. They just want to see the the practice improves. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, also, I missed um, both on that. <laughs> no, 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 that's that's fine. There's also a question from the audience. Uh, do you have any cognitive or development skills me measurements in participant children before and after Strive? And this is an excellent question, and we would love to, no. but we don't at this time. Um, we are hoping our plans are to do more rigorous research with parents and children and maybe even foster caregivers to gather more more data about the impact of the program but so far we haven't gotten to that level of data collection yet but it, we would like to um, okay questions about parental engagement yeah so we um, I mean, some of the way that we think about engagement is just our parents showing up for visits. And um, so that's one measure. And as we mentioned in the first uh, pilot, we um, did find that parents who involved, involved in STRIVE were more likely to attend their visits and not be a no-show in comparison to this propensity score matched comparison group. Um, we also look at engagement using um, some questions that have been um, slightly adapted. modified and adapted from the Yatchmanoff uh, engagement, scale. engagement scale, and not all of the domains that uh, she uses, but one part of that. So, um, but there's more to be done there as well. Let's see if there are any other questions. I know we're running out of the time. Um, In addition to Strive, are your partner sites using a parent coaching approach? Not to our knowledge at this point, no. Um, let's see, what else do we have? There was, there was a, that first question that I was answering had some other parts of it. Um, this one? Yeah. Do you follow this model? And I can do... Oh, I see. Yeah, I feel like there might be one. Let me look up here a little bit. 
Um, Susan, while you guys are looking for another yeah. place with this with this question about parent coaching, uh, maybe we could just add that there really is an element in Strive um, where the visit navigator works out with the parent how to support them during their visit. Um, so there would be opportunities for the Strive visit navigator to coach the parent, support the parent while they're visiting with their children. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I, I guess I misunderstood the question, so thank you for clarifying that, Kimberly. Um, oh, and so then there was, are there any plans for early childhood teachers to be able to become Strive Visit Navigators or otherwise involved? Well, we love this question. Good idea. Um, it's a great idea. And um, we would certainly be open to thinking about how that could happen if, for example, uh, visits were happening in the context of uh, an early childhood program or facility at start. Um, there certainly could be a way to do that, but we aren't at this point and we don't have specific plans. But if any of you out there in webinar land are interested <laughs> in exploring that, we would love to talk with you more about it. Well, and I just would add that now that our Department of Early Learning and the yes. uh, formerly known as Children's Administration are under the same roof with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, there are some real different and exciting opportunities for doing that. Uh, we do work a lot in the early learning realm as well. So I love that question, too. I had not thought about that, and we'll kind of have that in my mind as I'm in various meetings. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank um, you. We really appreciate your time and attention. And if you would like to follow up with us, um, this is my contact information, Susan Barkin and Laura Orlando. And if you want to speak to either of the other presenters, we can get you in touch with them as well. But just shoot us an email. And uh, thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today, and especially thank you so much to all of our presenters for such a thought-provoking presentation. Um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, you may be interested in future consortium webinars. This is the final webinar of the 2018-2019 series. Um, the 2019-2020 webinar series will begin in the fall. Um, so please see the information on this slide if you're interested in helping plan a webinar in the upcoming year. You can also join the consortium listserv to receive notifications about future webinars, a quarterly newsletter, as well as other job and event announcements. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my follow-up email, I will attach a copy of today's slides and a link to today's webinar, which was recorded and will be posted on SRCD's YouTube channel shortly. Thank you again to everyone for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day.